we're going to be looking at the very core issue of the entire abortion controversy. As I mentioned earlier, the question of when does human life begin? And again, in the interest of fairness, we, I have to emphasize that those who are advocates of abortion on demand, the overwhelming majority, in my judgment, take that position with the firm conviction that life does not begin at conception. There may be those who are persuaded that it does begin at conception, and nevertheless, they feel the freedom to destroy it. But if that's the case, they would represent a very tiny minority of those who are divided on it. And what we're going to do in this uh, session is to follow the same format that we have suggested already, that we look at the question of trying to determine the point of the origin of human life by looking at it from a biblical theological perspective and then from the perspective of science or natural law, and then finally from the perspective of the government or uh, the, uh, the legal uh, culture. So let's begin with the biblical uh, evidence for uh, the matter of the origin of human life. Now, I know that many of my colleagues in the field of theology <clears throat> and certainly multitudes of Christians are convinced that the Bible unambiguously teaches that human life begins at conception. I personally am not persuaded that we can know with compelling certainty, or at least that we know yet with compelling certainty, uh, from the source of Scripture that life begins at conception. I want to hasten to add that the overwhelming majority of the great theologians of church history have come to the conclusion that the overwhelming implicit evidence of sacred scripture indicates that life, in fact, begins at conception. But we have to be careful at this point and acknowledge that there's no text of scripture that comes right out explicitly and says human life begins at conception or that says abortion is murder. Now, obviously, our theology is built not only upon explicit, unambiguous statements, but those things that can reasonably be inferred from the uh, total witness of sacred Scripture. And I am convinced that Scripture uh, in all probability, and in terms of the overwhelming implications of Scripture, are enough to convince me that life does begin at conception. But I want to say that that doesn't mean that the arguments adduced from Scripture are absolutely conclusive regarding the point of origin. I think the Bible does teach that there's a continuity between prenatal and postnatal life, but is there anybody in the world that doubts that? One doesn't have to read the Bible to know that there's a con I mean, I know that at one time I was a fetus, and that you were a fetus, and you were a fetus, and you were a fetus, and everybody in this room and everybody that's watching on television, at one time you were a fetus. That's not in dispute. The question is, when you were a fetus, were you at that point in your development? a living human being. Now, I realize that's a, that's a close point, a technical point, but it's one that we have to keep in front of us. I don't want to claim more than we justly can claim. A similar point that I have made is that in the Sermon on the Mount, as we looked at in our, our last session, when Jesus, in developing the concept of the sanctity of life, gives a clear prohibition against hatred and unjustifiable anger. And we could translate that into categories like this to say that Jesus says not only does God condemn the actual destruction of actual human life, but the broader dimension 
of the teaching of God's law is that God forbids the potential destruction of actual human life. Now, here's where we have to think carefully. It's, we know that the Bible forbids the potential destruction of actual life. What does that say about the actual destruction of potential life? I think it says a lot. I mean, if it's, if it's, uh, if it's wrong to have a potential destruction of actual life, it's probably also wrong to have the actual destruction of potential life. But they're not the same thing. And so I don't think we can come to an absolute conclusion from the Sermon on the Mount at that point. Psalm 139 is often uh, quoted uh, as evidence of, uh, that from the Scripture that teaches that life begins at conception. We read uh, in verse 13 of Psalm 139, For thou hast possessed my reins, thou hast covered me in my mother's womb. And I will praise thee, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are thy works, and that my soul knows right well. My substance was not hid from thee when I was made in secret and curiously wrought in the lowest parts of the earth. And thine eyes, he's speaking now to God, thine eyes did see my substance yet being incomplete. And in thy book all of my members were written, which in continuance were fashioned, when as yet there was none of them. Now that sounds very much like David is saying that you, God, had a personal relationship with me before I was even born. We do know that the Bible talks about people who were known of God before they were born, while they were still in their mother's womb, who were sanctified while they were still in their mother's womb. And in fact, the Hebrew word that is used for a living, born child is the same Hebrew word that the, he that the Old Testament uses for a fetus. The same is also true in the Greek New Testament, that the same word for a postnatal human being is used to describe a prenatal human being. So that both uh, testaments call unborn children children. Again, that would seem to suggest that the biblical view is that people are people before they're born. But one can hold the view that the unborn child is not yet a child, is only a potential child, and we can speak of unborn children, meaning that these uh, fetuses are destined to become children. And as a manner of speaking, can safely be called children when in fact they're not yet children. And even if we could say that the Bible teaches that they are children before they're born, that doesn't mean that they're children at conception. It's not that clear. Those are things we must piece together from the total evidence of the Scripture. Again, I think these implications are significant. I don't think they're insignificant. I don't think they're devoid of meaning or empty in weight whatsoever. I'm just simply saying they're not absolutely conclusive. One of the fascinating texts in Scripture is in the first chapter of Luke. And one of the most uh, important for my consideration when we read in the narrative of the visit of Mary to her cousin Elizabeth. And uh, Mary is going, talking to Elizabeth and telling her about this visitation from Gabriel and the Annunciation that she is about to have a child uh, from the Holy Spirit. And Already, Elizabeth is pregnant with John the Baptist. And on the occasion of that meeting, Elizabeth says to Mary that when Mary approached her, having Jesus in her own womb, Elizabeth says that the baby in her womb leaped for joy, presumably John the Baptist, whose vocation is to be a herald of the king, to point people to Jesus, responds 
to the conceived Jesus in the womb of his mother, while John the Baptist himself is already st is still in the womb of his mother. That there is recognition and reaction to Jesus by the herald of Jesus while both are still in the womb. Now that's, that's an amazing thing to me and uh, screams to me that these, these uh, fetuses were not simple fetuses but were living human beings. One of the most important texts for me is that found in the Old Testament book of Exodus in chapter 21. I don't have time to go into a detailed exegesis of Exodus 21 for you tonight. I'm simply going to say to you that even among uh, uh, theologians and Old Testament scholars, there's considerable debate about the interpretation of Exodus 21 that talks about the law of Israel that is applied when men are fighting together, and as they are fighting, one of them accidentally, presumably, uh, knocks into a woman who is pregnant, and the result is that the woman uh, issues the baby. Now, the big problem is that does the text, does the word in Hebrew mean, does she uh, have an abortion or the, the, the uh, fetus is dead, or does this accident precipitate a premature birth. And then the text goes on to say that if no harm follows, and it's vague as to whether the harm that follows is to the mother or to the baby, then a fine at the discretion of the father is to be imposed upon the negligent party that caused this inconvenience. But if harm follows, then the law, the lex talionis, the law of vengeance is to be applied life for life so on, eye for eye, tooth for tooth. Now, one way of looking at the text would say that if the harm that follows means that this baby that is born prematurely dies, then the eye for the eye, tooth for tooth, life for life law is to apply, which in that case would clearly mean that that unborn fetus is considered to be alive. Now, it still doesn't tell us when it becomes alive, whether it's at conception or at some point later on, but it would certainly say that that fetus was alive. But again, there are still questions about the literary structure of that verse and the precise meaning of some of the words that I don't want to rest a case upon it. The very minimum we get out of Exodus 21 is that the unborn child in Israel was protected by Jewish law and was considered to be extremely valuable. So, uh, but it doesn't necessarily prove that it was given the same value as a human life. Let's turn now, if we can quickly, from the biblical considerations to the, consensus, to the uh, viewpoint of church history, which involves the reflection of the best minds of the church on the biblical teaching. One thing that's uh, fascinating to me that one of the earliest documents that survives from the ancient early Christian church is a book called the Didache, or the Teaching. And as I say, it is one of the earliest catechetical instruction manuals that goes back probably to the first century itself. And this is not a book of the Bible, but what it does represent clearly to us is the understanding of the early Christian church on issues of this type, because there is no ambiguity in the Didache. The Didache sets forth as a clear, emphatic prohibition, thou shalt not commit murder by abortion. I mean, clearly, in the Didache, abortion is considered murder, which indicates that at least the early church believed that abortion was murder. That was true as the church progressed through the ages. It was the view of, a, of Augustine. It was the view of Aquinas. It was the view of Calvin. It was the view of Luther. It was the view of Edwards. And even into the 20th century, where we've moved into a time in theology where less authority 
was accorded to Scripture than, say, would have been given by Augustine and Aquinas and those people, by people and professors like Karl Barth, Emil Brunner, and the German ethicist Helmut Tillichy, all have taken very strong stands on this question, saying in their judgment, there's no question that abortion is a form of murder. And uh, that gets my attention, that we see such a, a, a consensus in the history of Christianity. But now I want to take some time to look at natural law. Is there something that we can discover from natural law that we don't discern in the writings of the text of Scripture? First of all, when we look at nature, and we're trying to make a scientific designation as when a person is a person, we are trying to discover discernible, clear lines of demarcation. One of the most obvious, simple, and easy lines of demarcation that we can ever find is birth. And many people say, there's no question about that. Once the umbilical cord is, is cut, and that infant now is breathing uh, on his own, is no longer dependent upon the nourishment and uh, system of his mother, and is an individuated human being, then they are clearly alive. Now, there, there are, again, as I say, some who, who will not grant that even then the person is human. It takes a while beyond it, but the overwhelming majority of, of people and scientists would agree that after birth, at least, uh, a person is human. But now the question is, is there another point before birth? And that's what the question is in, uh, in the abortion issue. The, the issue isn't over whether or not this is, is not an issue of infanticide. It is an issue of whether or not it is appropriate to kill unborn fetuses. Now, if we're going to look for significant points of, de of uh, departure between birth and however far you want to go back in history uh, of the potential development of this human being, the next clearest line of demarcation is conception. There are other points along the way, uh, implantation, what some call quickening, or when the heart starts beating, or when brain waves are discernible, uh, and so on. But as I say, the most obvious point of demarcation, where the process of the production of a child begins, is at conception. What has been important to the medical decision on this is, is a, a relatively recent discovery. By recent, I don't mean last week, but I mean 20th century. And that is that we understand in modern science that the entire genetic code that generates the individual particular characteristics, size, shape, and development, all of that, of a personal human being, that entire genetic code is established at conception. Not six weeks after, or 12 weeks after, or three months, or six months, but at the point of conception, the entire genetic code is there. Within 18 to 25 days after conception, there is a discernible heartbeat. And the beating of the heart, though in and of itself, does not usually constitute the, I mean, as the cessation of the beating of the heart doesn't immediately constitute the cessation of life in the judgment of the medical community. The beating of the heart is a very significant consideration when we're talking about human life. I think we all understand that, particularly if our heart should stop this night. Within eight weeks, which is still very early in the, in the first trimester, brain waves and fingerprints are present in this fetus. Between 12 and 13 weeks, this fetus sucks its thumb and recoils from pain.
two occasions I've heard people use statements to describe the nature of, fe of, of fetus. One person described a fetus as an undifferentiated mass of protoplasm. And I think that's an intemperate statement. But not only is it intemperate, it is simply biologically incorrect. It is not an undifferentiated mass of protoplasm. It is a mass that is already genetically differentiated, and one that has a heartbeat and brain waves and so on. Heard another person describe an unborn baby that was aborted as simply so much domestic sewage. Now again, that is an intemperate emotive statement that adds little to any sober discussion of when life begins. But if we're going to call an aborted fetus sewage, then this demeans the, the process that involves a beating heart. I've never seen sewage with a beating heart or with brain waves. This, has to, this reflects to me not just a question of a, a, view, a low view of the fetus, but a low view of life altogether. That's why I labored in the second discussion the significance of understanding the sanctity of life in general. It's an amazing thing that this embryo has the genetic code intact, that in a few weeks, has a, a few days, has a heartbeat, brain waves, all of those things that are critical to discerning the presence of human life. I once read a book entitled Window on the Womb. Some of you perhaps have seen that book. And the thing that, that attracted my attention to that is the same type of thing that, that uh, grabbed my attention in seeing the movie entitled The Silent Scream with those who are opposed to uh, uh, the pro-life movement feels just a piece of propaganda. If you remember the silent scream, it was really a video camera shot of a uh, uh, record of an actual abortion, where one could see very clearly in the film the reaction of the fetus to the invasion of its body of a knife and clamps that crushed its skull and cut its limbs. And you could see this fetus's face literally contorting in horror as an, a, an adult human being would if they were subjected to the same kinds of pain. And that's why the movie was called A Silent Scream. You couldn't hear the scream. And the point of the book, The uh, Window on the Womb, is that we don't see what's going on inside the womb in the midst of an abortion. But now we have the advanced, sophisticated technology by which we can actually film what is happening in abortions as they are taking place. And what astonishes me more than anything else is that how somebody could watch the drama of what is taking place here, see it visually, not just theorize about it abstractly, but see it visually and not be persuaded that what we're dealing with here is a human being. Because the response is essentially the same as that would be of a two-year-old child to this kind of pain. But you see, we're voting and deciding on ethical issues and civil matters that are beyond our vision. It's been said that the most dangerous place in the United States of America right now is a woman's womb. It's the place where most people die. But it's invisible. And since we can't see, women go through, an emo, go through an emotional experience when they can feel their developing child. We call it quickening. But if you can't feel it, you can't hear it, and you can't see it, we don't think it's real. But with the instrumentation we have of perceiving what is actually there from conception, what is actually there from conception exhibits all of the necessary characteristics 
of human life. We know this much for sure, that at conception, the natural development of a living human being begins. I was on the train a few weeks ago, and I was discussing this matter with a man, and he said to me, what's the difference between an unfertilized egg and a male sperm that have never met and the fertilized egg? What's the difference? The obvious difference is conception. That is a difference. Now the egg is fertilized, the genetic code is placed intact, and it's all the difference in the world because you can have, as I say, 59 million sperms swimming as hard as they can, and an egg over here defending itself as hard as they can. You can have that forever and never have a human being. But once we have conception, the process begins that is moving and driving towards a human child. And so conception is a crucial point. Now, quickly, as my time is running out, I want to touch on the government or the legal view. In my judgment, the current law of the United States does not adequately answer the question at all of the origin of human life. For the most part, it is agnostic, and in some senses, even contradictory. Again, in my judgment, the weakest part of Roe versus Wade is found in the attempt of the court to make the legal point that is crucial the point of so-called viability. A viability means that time in the development of a child when, if that child is born prematurely or whatever, it has the ability to survive. It is livable. It is viable. Right. And so the ruling of the court was that after viability, Abortions are not permitted except under certain extenuating circumstances. Incidentally, the net effect have been that those circumstances are easily uh, uh, gotten around so that abortions are in fact legal now all the way into the third trimester and are being done into the third trimester. But the problem with viability, ladies and gentlemen, is that it tends to be arbitrary because it's a sliding point. It's not a fixed point in this continuum between conception and birth. In fact, since Roe versus Wade in 1973, the expected age of the viability of the embryo has been shortened by at least two weeks because of increased technology in uh, incubation techniques. Now, on this particular point of viability, Sandra Day O'Connor, who, as you know, is a justice of the Supreme Court of the United States, wrote a criticism of setting the point of decisive significance at viability, in which she said, quote, in Roe, the court held that although the state had an important and legitimate interest in protecting potential life, that interest could not become compelling until the point at which the fetus was viable. You see, the problem is, why I said it's an inherent contradiction here, that the court, in its judgment, in Roe versus Wade, said that, yes, the government, the state, does have a legitimate interest to protect the right of a potential human being, but that that interest doesn't become compelling until viability. The difficulty with this analysis is clear, says Sandra Day O'Connor. Potential life is no less potential in the first week of pregnancy than it is at viability or afterwards. The choice of viability as the point at which the state interest in potential life becomes compelling is no less arbitrary than choosing any point before viability or any point afterwards. 
Accordingly, I believe that the state's interest in protecting potential human life exists throughout the entire pregnancy. See, once the court that made the distinction between potential and actual human life, they are caught on the horns of a dilemma. If the state is responsible to protect potential human life, then as, as Sandra Day O'Connor says, it is potential human life at the moment of conception. And it is, has potentiality moving to the direction, to the natural conclusion of birth. And to put the legal definition of life at the point of viability is an exercise in despair because of its implicit arbitrariness. The net effect of Roe versus Wade has been to offer little actual protection to a fetus before birth. Now, the next thing I want us to look at, ladies and gentlemen, is what is the state's responsibility to protect the unborn child? And how does the state's responsibility dovetail or relate to the church? What is the church's role in the abortion issue, what is the relationship of church and state? And we'll look at that in our next session.